Happy Wednesday, everybody, and welcome to another Australia at Home lunchtime discussion. Um, I'm not at home today. It's the first time in the 11 weeks of Australia at Home I'm actually back in the office. Um, and one of the reasons for that is just there are too many people at home today for me to be at home for the rest of Australia. But it's, it's, it's surreal coming out into the world after, I think, the experience we've all been through over the last three months of getting used to working from our home and connecting from our home, coming back into the CBD is um, quite a surreal experience. But the, um, the topic of working from home and working through technology is actually the anchor point um, of today's discussion that um, we'll be launching into in just a couple of minutes. Um, before we get cracking though, um, just to pay my respects to traditional owners. I know wherever we are in Australia, we are all on traditional land and I do pay my respects to the traditional owners of my land, which is the Gadigal people, the Eora Nation, and recognise, well, pay respect to um, elders past, present and emerging, but also to recognise the land was never ceded and to reflect, I think, particularly after the weekend and the last couple of weeks, how that truth that land is never ceded um, still writes so much of the history that we're living through today. Um, for those that are new to Australia at Home, you've really come to the party late, but welcome. Um, the way we like to run these events is in a very relaxed, um, collaborative and supportive way, respectful exchange of ideas and challenging each other to think deeper and do better. Um, the way we like to run it is to have your gallery on, which is the top right hand of your screen. Turn your camera on if you can, so you can see the nearly 100 people that are already with us in this discussion. We had 250 registered today, but we're getting a, an increased drop off rate as people sort of find better things to do with their lunchtime, but it's great for those that are here today. Um, use the chat. Um, AFSA is running tech support today. So if you do have any problems, you can direct message her. But just use the chat to introduce yourself, um, let people know what brought you to this conversation. And as we um, go through what's a really fascinating presentation, um, put some questions in and I'll call people up to, to, to talk with our, our guests. And at this point, I'll introduce our three guests today. Um, first, we've got um, Dr. Mark Andreevich, who's a professor in media at Monash, and is also the lead investigator or a lead investigator with a new project um, that the ARC is funding with the Centre of Excellence on Automated Decision Making. And Mark will talk, tell us a bit more about that later, but it's really an attempt to think through technology before it happens, so to look down the road um, so that we're better prepared um, for the changes that we're living through. We're also really lucky to have Kobe Leans, who's a senior um, research fellow in digital ethics at Melbourne Uni School of Engineering. Um, she brings a much broader perspective of, of, of technology to this discussion. And finally, um, a very old friend and colleague of mine, Adam Searle, who is not only the New South Wales Shadow um, Minister for Industrial Relations, he's also their leader in the Upper House, and he's instrumental in a really exciting inquiry into the future of work, which is one of the anchor points of today's discussion. Um, the catalyst of putting this group together is really a briefing that we've held with unions earlier today, which was to um, work with them to think through this inquiry that's going on in the New South Wales Upper House into the future of work, in particular, the, the role of workplace surveillance, um, which used to be about video monitoring in a warehouse or, um, you know, whether or not your emails were read by your employer, but has become something much more as we've moved into the era of what Shoshana Zuboff calls surveillance capitalism, which is the idea that everything we do online is captured and repurposed and um, extracted for its value. And um, particularly in the workplace where we're paid to do certain tasks, that whole issue of who owns the information that you create while you're working incidental to your work is a really open debate. And it's a really exciting moment that we've got um, a parliament in Australia that's prepared to look at those issues. So the discussion this morning was um, really to, to get unions from different industries to be thinking about how that impacts on them. And then we thought, you know, in a normal world, we would have all gone to the pub and probably done a politics in the pub with the broader public. So you're our politics in the pub today, although I hope none of you are drinking because it's only one o'clock. Um, but what was really interesting about the, um, the, the, um, the session this morning, um, Mark 
gave a presentation about some of the trends that he's been picking up on since the lockdown occurred. So we thought it might be an interesting way to kick off today's discussion. Before I introduce Kobe and Adam, maybe bring in Mark and, and for him to take us through some of the kind of surprising, scary, but actually predictable as well, trends that we've been seeing through this remarkable point in time. So Mark, thanks for joining us. And um, as you do what I normally do on a Tuesday, which is awkwardly work through a PowerPoint to slideshow, um, how have you been going through this lockdown? And, you know, tell us a bit about this research you've done over the, um, the last couple of days. Thanks, Peter, and thanks, everybody, uh, for showing up. It's, it is indeed an interesting time to think about uh, the ways in which the technologies that we use to connect with one, each other, with one another are also monitoring technologies. Probably many of you know that the platform we're using now, Zoom, uh, had a feature called attention monitoring that would allow whoever is running the meeting to see how, if the other people in the meeting had moved away from the Zoom screen and were doing other things on their computers. Um, that has been disabled after some complaints. Uh, so we're not able to tell whether you are moving away from, from your Zoom screen. Uh, but the very fact that that capability was in there tells us something about um, the monitoring capability of these technologies that we're becoming increasingly reliant on. We know, you know, pretty much, we know this because we've been studying how it works or we've been encountering how it works in the, in the realm of consumption in a variety of ways. Any network digital device is also a monitoring device. And as, as the work that we do moves onto these devices, it increasingly becomes subject to the forms of monitoring that are enabled by network digital technologies. And um, I thought I'd start out by saying a couple of things about, about the current moment and then uh, and, and giving you some examples. Uh, and then, you know, kind of raising some questions uh, about the implications of, uh, of the development of this technology for thinking about the workplace. So, as we know, uh, one of the results of the current crisis has been the attempt to move as many people as possible out of the workplace and into working at home conditions. And in many circumstances um, where that is possible, uh, the technologies become a key player in enabling the forms of communication and networking and sharing of materials uh, that we need to engage in as we do our work. For other folks, uh, in many cases, even, even for those forms of labor that um, are not able to, to be uh, moved out of the workplace and into the home, we've seen the development of a range of monitoring technologies. And I'll, I'll talk about a few of those. Um, you may have noticed, I, I've, I noticed in uh, Melbourne where I live that some of the shops, the, uh, supermarkets that remained open that I went to have in effect been turned into uh, warehouses, not just the big ones, um, you know, where uh, people order from home and uh, the employees in the supermarket are gathering materials, but even some smaller shops where people stay at home, they send in their information, and that leads to a new infrastructure so that the folks who are actually working in the store become in effect, um, maybe more like warehouse workers. They, they move through the store with electronic devices that tell them what uh, bundle of goods has been ordered and they package them and send them out. So you, you see even in the retail space, um, some transformations that are associated with the current restrictions. Uh, so bearing that in mind, I thought I'd say a little bit about two different types of examples. One is workplace, work floor uh, forms of digital tracking. Uh, and, you know, Amazon got received a lot of coverage when it developed this wristband that for workers who are collecting goods off of shelves in their warehouses would actually tell them if they were reaching in the wrong direction, would send, send a feedback signal to them. That's, you, you know, you're not, you're not reaching in the right place. And of course, at the same time, would be able to collect detailed information about how fast each worker is working. Uh, you, you know, technologies that um, have become kind of commonplace efficiency enhancers uh, often very much at the same time are redoubled as uh, surveillance technologies. So think of this very commonplace technology like um, the barcode scanner that you see in most supermarkets. That makes checkout faster in some ways, but it also develops new metrics that are used to evaluate 
uh, the worker in the in the supermarket. So um, their scan rate becomes one of the uh, metrics that are used to evaluate their worker performance. Uh, so this combination of efficiency, uh, flexibility on the one hand, and monitoring on the other is, is characteristic of the developments in the technology. The other thing to say about what's happening with Amazon, when they develop these technologies, one of the roles is not just uh, so-called efficiency enhancement or even uh, worker control. Um, it's worth noting that every year Amazon fires about 10% of its workforce and then replaces it with people who they, they try to um, uh, have live up to whatever to their ever escalating um, metrics for performance, which have been received a fair amount of coverage in the press in terms of the um, uh, increasingly onerous conditions for workplace labor in the in the Amazon warehouse warehouses. Uh, but this technology is also being used to develop automated systems with the down the road goal of being able to displace workers with automated um, technologies. So, you know, this is Uber's big bet. Um, I don't know if it's going to pan out, but, you know, they're able to uh, be a kind of take huge losses in uh, this gig economy that they're developing, which is at the same time quite exploitative in terms of the folks who are working for them in anticipation eventually of being able to automate uh, uh, rideshare services. Um, so what you're saying with this technology, Mark, and we can see the image of the worker being their every movement. So on one level, it is monitoring a performance to see that they're putting things in the right place. But I guess there's two other things. The second use is to come up with systems to make them move things quicker. So to make it effectively more productive. But the third one is you can kind of see this is almost a template for a robot to then do what the worker's doing if they collect enough of these movements over time. Yeah, that's right. To gather information about which movements are the most common, which then allows them to reconfigure the space for more wow. efficient um, uh, collection of, uh, of, of goods. So it allows them to both anticipate a kind of robotic system, but also imagine how the space itself can uh, be rearranged. Um, so the, uh, I, I, I thought it was worth pointing out, uh, you know, maybe one other point about what's taking place with Amazon. Um, the current conditions in which uh, we have escalating levels of unemployment because of um, the, shut, the forms of shutdown that are associated with the response to the virus does create an increasing surplus workforce, which gives companies like Amazon the incentive to, well, if we lay off 10% of our workforce and then try to ramp up uh, full, you know, a new set of employees and work them even harder, maybe burn them out faster, we'll be able to replace them. Now, you know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure they can count on that level of surplus uh, unemployment um, long-term, but uh, it's certainly a strategy they're able to avail themselves of. The other thing I wanted to say a little bit about is, um, and we heard a little, some of this this morning, uh, talking to the union folks, the use of concerns about the virus to introduce new technologies or to ramp up existing technologies for geolocational tracking in the workplace and even on the shop floor. This is a little demo. I just put it in there because I thought it was interesting. So um, this is as if everyone's got their COVID-19 app on and the green ones are the clear people and the red ones are... Well, the, the, the red is if you come into too close contact. Yeah. So you don't even need to have, you don't, you don't need to have data about the people, but just that moment where people brush near each other or they're walking near each other, that shows they're too close. So this, this is a smart camera technology which tracks uh, interpersonal interactions. And so you'll see when those two people cross each other, all of a sudden it goes red. And then when they pull apart, mm. it goes green again. Um, so what you're able to do is, on the one hand, enforce, uh, you know, social distancing restrictions. But on the other hand, you're also able to look at patterns of um, interaction between workers, which, uh, you know, in, in places, in warehouses that, for example, might be working to organize. Um, if ah. somebody is identified as an organizer, you can see who they're interacting with or who they come into close contact with. So it's a pretty, um, if you couple this with facial recognition technology, um, you get quite high level resolution of uh, always on tracking. Um, I, I might just bring Kobe in here because Kobe's looked at the, the application. This is a classic case
of you can't unlearn technology. So even if, you know, a technology like this makes total sense in the sense of um, enforcing social distancing, it can, there, there are no ground rules around what else it could be used for. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I was just going to jump in, Mark, as you were speaking, as I was thinking about how Facebook data is now also made publicly available. So if you have a Facebook account, unless you opt out, your tracking is also being moved. And of course, there are assurances that that is not granular detail, that it's not any kind of data that anyone could re-identify as you. But as some of the work that I've been doing shows, if you have three data points from any anybody, you can re-identify that person. So again, this is not about individual systems, which I think Mark would also probably agree with you in the workplace. You might have a number of different platforms that are collecting data about you and how those are then used in conjunction with each other if they're shared or what you are even aware of is a further question. So I suspect most people using Facebook wouldn't think of it as being used as a geo tracker at this point in time. So yeah, lots of issues to think about, not just in the workplace, but also in the street. Yeah. And then we get to the um, workplace, which is even scarier, Mark. Yeah, so I, uh, some technologies, the folks who develop these um, apps that can be installed on computers to monitor remote workers, have seized on the moment as an opportunity to uh, amp up the sales of their wares. And apparently they're getting a lot more interest. I've, I was reading an account of one of the folks who develops these, uh, sells this technology was saying they have four times the number of um, uh, interest queries that they've had uh, over previous uh, years. So the interest in developing, and these, these have, Basically what these are, it's software that gets installed on a, on a computer um, that allows uh, employers to track what a worker who's working remotely is doing. And they have a variety of different features. They can do things like track, um, you know, when, when the worker is logged in to work. They can do things like mirror the, the um, some of these applications mirror the, the screen. So what you'd imagine is an office like the one Peter's in with a bunch of Nobody's there except open computers. And those computers mirror the screens of the remote workers. And then Peter could go through the office and just look and see what's on each screen uh, of all of the remote workers in, in order to see what's taking place. Some of them do um, uh, randomly timed screenshots that get sent to the employer. So you're working from home, you never know when a screenshot's going to be taken of what you're doing. So this moment. is actually a pitch the to the employer, this, yes. this slide you're looking at. This is yes. all the evil things an employer can do. Yeah, exactly. And the, the pitches to the employers can look quite extreme. Everything they saw, said, and did is audited. You probably wouldn't pitch it to the employees this way, but this is the way it's being pitched to the, to the client who can purchase this. Um, and, uh, and, and these have several goals. You know, one goal is security. Uh, you know, to make sure that secure files aren't being shared. But, you know, the other goal is uh, accountability to make sure the um, employee is working. Uh, the other goal is performance to evaluate, you know, the speed and the efficiency with which the worker is working. And also to potentially ramp up uh, expectations and to create new forms of uh, metricization and datification. So to create new categories of monitoring folks to see if they're living up to them. So the, you know, you can see in the, uh, in the, discussions, uh, uh, you know, in the promotional material, the way this is, the very fact that you're measuring is then turned into a, a, a means of kind of ramping up expectations. Once you know what they're doing, you can give them an incentive to um, do more faster. Um, you can set standards and you can show them how they're doing. So you can start to, in a way, gamify um, the process. You know, sometimes if you get a Fitbit, you know, and you first do, you, you just keep trying to see how many steps you can do, and then you just keep ramping that up. You know, so instead you see how many keys you can punch, and you know, the question isn't how good the, key, the keys you punch are, it's how many you do. Well, and, and that's an important point, kind of what gets left out. So yeah. elements of, of, the, of work that can't be metricized then run danger of being excluded, and new forms of, of uh, you know, um, saying to workers, well, you know, you stepped away from the computer, that doesn't count as work, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to compensate you for that. Whereas in the workplace, you know, there's some understanding, you need some time, get up, get a drink, uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, the other thing it enables, of course, um, which is something of concern in the current environment, is the possibility of transforming, um, you know, uh, existing jobs into 
uh, temporary or contract labor. So it can be done on an ad hoc basis when when needed. Um, so making making the workforce uh, you know more precarious, um, more contract based, without the forms of security and uh, safety that are associated with with the workplace. So there are a host of issues that are raised by this technology. Um, the promise is convenience, flexibility, efficiency. Uh, but then the flip side is increasingly powerful forms of monitoring that change the balance of power between the um, uh, between the employer and the employee because of the huge amounts of data collection that are enabled by the development of, of the technology. Um, one and, and I'll, I'll just probably leave it at that for discussion. But one point I, I would like to put out there, I, I want to uh, express my thanks to uh, Lauren Kelly of the United Workers Union, um, with whom I talked through some of these issues. And, and one of the things that she brought up is, and, and I think it is important as we think about the tech, um, is all of the for, uh, all of the ways in which surveillance is already baked into existing relations that may not even need this kind of technology, but that can uh, that we should probably keep our eyes on as well as we as we take a look at the technology but think of also the ways in which workers are sorted and uh, evaluated and um, casualized uh, as part of the structure of existing social relations the, the invocation I, I i'll just close with this one point i thought it was interesting you know the invocation of the notion of surveillance capitalism which has gained currency in the in the contemporary moment it it kind of implies that you know, because it's surveillance capitalism, that there might be other forms of capitalism. But um, it's, it's probably, I, I think it's probably safer to say that, you know, uh, capitalism relies on surveillance as, you know, a, a structural way of um, monitoring workers and managing efficiency and uh, negotiating worker relations. So part of the, part of the labor um, relation is surveillance based almost inherently. But we're seeing that kind of ramp up in digital ways uh, that complement existing forms of surveillance. Great, we've got a couple of questions from the floor. So maybe we'll come up for air in terms of stopping the screenshot. Um, Abda had a question and then um, we might go to Julie. Sure, can, I, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Um, my question was just about the data in the Australian context. Um, the surveillance material that's that's owned by the employer that's produced when they're um, monitoring employer employees is that owned by the company or by the provider or does it depend on the licensing arrangement? I I suspect it depends on the licensing arrangement, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I, I I don't know the details. Typically, I, my guess is that they would say. This is your data. You know, we're not we're not claiming ownership of this data, but ownership is such an interesting category here because even if they have access to this data, they might not be able to claim ownership of it. But there is a question: the extent to which they can put it to use. So, uh, the company that has this data might be able to find ways to data mine the data without claiming ownership, but then derive patterns from the data. To, you know, the findings they're able to get from data mining. Oh, we noticed that employees who routinely do this uh, are likely to be, you know, more more likely to leave or to turn over. Um, and then once they derive those insights from the data, they don't need to actually claim ownership of the data to be able to derive those insights. Yeah. Kobe, do you have any? I don't know. Thoughts on that or? Yeah, I think, I mean, using, the, so the, the area I've been looking at is the app more recently, so not directly workplace related, but those questions are really complex and case specific. So in the case of the COVID app, one of the concerns that was raised is that that data once collected um, under international agreements might actually be hosted on Amazon servers, which then might be able to be ac accessed by third parties. And some of those questions are legal, but some of them are also technical and they also don't necessarily address how easy it is to hack or to access some of that information. So I happened to be working for ANU when all of the data was lifted from ANU. And of course they had very secure systems in place and yet these data sets can always be violated in some way. There's always a risk wherever you have a data set as Mark says that it can be uh, hacked, that it can be repurposed, um, that it can be reused in a different way that wasn't necessarily intended. So it's a very big question and it really depends on each agreement but also the technical side of things. So if something's easy to hack, that's you can circumvent the legal uh, requirements. And I know people who are quite good at doing so. Adam, I might bring you into the conversation. As a legislator, you see how quickly technology uh, and capitalism, I guess, makes the most of an opportunity. Does it make you feel a bit powerless and reactive in the way that you, you can respond to these sorts of trends? Uh, 
you just have to unmute yourself. Yep. Mo most laws are reactive. You know, they're created to deal with situations that have arisen. Uh, and the workplace uh, surveillance laws we currently have in New South Wales really go back to when we worked together, Peter, in the late 1990s. There was a series of industrial disputes in warehouses about the employer putting covert surveillance in allegedly to counter theft from those warehouses. And what resulted was legislation where employers had to go and get a, essentially a, approval from a magistrate to put in cameras. Uh, those cameras had to be visible. They had to be advertised. And any, any footage derived could not be used for any purpose that is unrelated to the security of that workplace. And those laws were updated a little bit in 2005 to take into account technological change to cover tracking of the kind that Mark has spoken about and also uh, work done on computers. Um, and those laws were groundbreaking at the time. I think they were the first in the country, but obviously people get distracted by technology. The technology is really just the most recent manifestation of pre-existing and age-old power imbalances in the workplace, uh, which leads us to the current New South Wales Upper House Inquiry. Uh, after the last election, we had committed to reviewing workplace surveillance laws. Uh, very quickly, we decided in opposition that we needed a wide ranging review of the whole world of work and how it's regulated. Uh, we're dealing with 12 uh, separate areas of inquiry, five relating to gig work or gig work platforms, but four of them relate to this sort of notion not just of workplace surveillance, but really workplace information, uh, how it is developed, how it's recorded, and to take uh, Mark's point, and I think one of the other participants said, it's not really a question of who owns the information, it's who has access to it, and then who can put it to use. And, you know, leaving aside individual licensing arrangements, in most of the cases that I'm aware of, it's only the employer that often is even aware of what information is being recorded and they're able to then uh, weaponize it in terms of uh, working out who which are the best workers to put on what rosters or how to organize a workplace or, or, and those sort of things and so then they can derive they think financial value from that but because of because that information is opaque because only the employer has access the individual workers or even collective workers through their unions have no agency, they have no access to it, and they've got no way of sharing in the benefits of any productivity growth that information is used. So we're hoping this inquiry will really draw out uh, the dimensions of, of the issues that are occurring in the workplace and hopefully uh, posit some uh, regulatory solutions so that we can update the law. And, and, and put workers, at least in part, in the driver's seat or, at worst, make them more, uh, more equal partners uh, in, in how the information is, is currently used. And, of course, leaving aside employers generally, the New South Wales state government is not only the single biggest employer in Australia, it's, you know, this, it's got the single, one of the single biggest data sets generated by their workforce, but also from their other customers in the wider community and how they keep that information and what purposes they put it to uh, are really big issues that we need to discuss as a society. Toby, you've written about the risk of the legislative lag, you have a change and then the law takes time to catch up by which point the change has become embedded um, and become the norm. What could we learn about how other sectors or other parts of our society have dealt with change when we're looking at the workplace? Yeah, look, it's one of the problems with the law is that the nature of law is that it's almost always uh, retroactive. One of, the, uh, one of the issues that I, or one of the case studies I've been looking at has been RoboDebt and in only, as early as 2004, the government already looking at some principles around automated decision making. So one of the concerns around the regulation is that, and that, you know, the, the goal now that um, it's been found that RoboDebt is illegal is that all people should be restituted and Well, you're, you're, you're entering that lag world. The reality is 
Oh, no. Here you go. Try Let's again. Try. I'm just going to try. Um, While Kobe's speaking on that, um, yeah, Mark, just reflecting can on... Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Go again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, the All joys right. of technology. I know. We've been going so well, too. <laughs> There you are. No. Okay. So, so what I was saying was that um, in terms of government automated decision making, Australians aren't necessarily even aware of how it's being used. But again, back to the point I made earlier, they're not necessarily aware that their tax information might be being linked to their Medicare information, which might be being linked to their healthcare, uh, to other health information. So uh, the ability to regulate is going to require a lot of different points at which we think about these systems. So it's not just how the systems are designed, what initial data sets they use, because we know that a lot of the data sets are already inherently biased and then replicate that bias. But it's also thinking about the algorithms that are used and what those algorithms are also contemplating, who's creating them. A lot of them have blind spots that don't necessarily think about um, who's going to use them and how they're going to be used. So there is, there are a whole series of points at which regulation is going to have to think of intervening and it's, it's quite, which is why it's so complicated and why it hasn't been resolved simply yet, but it's why it's so important to have these conversations and to understand the problems inherent in the systems themselves. Um, as we've already discussed, how the data is collected and then how it's repurposed, how it's reused, who has access. There are so many different points where the regulation is going to have to contemplate protection of individuals, both in the workplace and outside of the workplace, which currently is not happening. Right. We've got a question slash comment from Colin from the VTHC. Are you there, Colin? I'm probably making it. There, hello, there he is. Yeah. Uh, I was just presuming that others can tell us whether it's so or not that uh, technological surveillance would be an, allow an allowable matter for enterprise bargaining. So whether a workforce or a union could uh, seek to ban it during enterprise bargaining negotiations. Maybe that's one for Adam. Well, uh, look, it may be allowable. I don't think it's addressed in federal workplace laws at all. Um, obviously, Traditionally, in awards, you've had so-called termination, change and redundancy clauses where employers are supposed to consult over technological change and obviously the automated monitoring and surveillance of the kind that we've been discussing would surely fall into that category. Um, it's a question of whether or not workplaces are even aware of any proposals to monitor what they do and whether or not workers and their unions are prepared to put it on the table as something they want to bargain about. I don't think there's any, any prohibition in current uh, workplace laws that would prevent that from happening, but I'm just not aware of unions in the national system uh, putting those issues on the table. So maybe it's a question of awareness and, and, and wanting to do so. On that note, I might also call Julie up who had a kind of related comment question there about an appetite for national regulation. You still there, Julie? Otherwise, so she was interested in understanding the appetite for national regulation of workplace surveillance rather than state by state. Um, and her, um, her observation was have been to OAIC and they are not good at understanding this issue and there are state differences. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. I just read oh, your yeah. question. Why don't you expand on it? He's fiddling with the uh, buttons. Um, so always so, a uh, just a, a couple of points uh, that I would throw in from my experience of being surveilled in the workplace and uh, trying to pursue a remedy. Um, I found that um, my organisation was part of a national organisation. Um, but the surveillance occurred in Queensland, which does not have a specific act, unlike New South Wales. Um, but it threw up other issues such as um, if your organisation is using another provider, so you're leasing your computers from someone, there were questions about your rights uh, or their rights to your data on their computer. Um, so that was an issue that was never resolved. It's too hard for uh, all of the regulators to answer that question. Um, the other issues uh, that came up were that even though my workplace had a policy that allowed people to have personal use, 
of their computers. So if you want to do your banking, for example, and that's very common in workplaces, do your banking, talk to your partner, um, you know, uh, fill out a bank application a lot for a loan, that kind of stuff. Um, I did all of that stuff on my computer and my employer harvested that and took all of my personal info and put it in a special file and it sat on their server for like seven years until uh, a whistleblower found it. And um, I then spent two years in the OAIC trying to find out what they had done with my information, um, why they did it, um, and get an apology. And so after two years, I just kind of got a half-assed apology and not much else. And I found that the OAIC was totally unequipped to deal with this as an issue. They had absolutely no idea what to do. They took the approach of trying to conciliate rather than um, come in and say to the employer, hang on a minute, this is unacceptable. Um, and so it really did throw up these questions for me about, uh, for workers generally, if your employer says you can use your computer for personal use, that doesn't mean that the employer is not collecting your data. Um, that doesn't mean that they're storing it on their server where multiple other people and contractors who are working on the computer can come in and have a look. Um, and it doesn't mean that there are other federal led, um, agencies like the Federal Police or ACORN, uh, for example, um, who can do something as well. So um, I guess I just wanted to throw those issues in because for me, it was a very unsatisfactory outcome. Um, I wasn't the only person that they did it to in this workplace. There are about 20 people that that happened to. Um, and part of the problem was that it was Queensland. And I think if it had happened in New South Wales, there might have been a different outcome. But if we're talking about this as a general issue facing workers, what is to stop a New South Wales employer from engaging a Queensland contractor to provide computers and to store data in Queensland, yeah. for example, to get around it? So I think there's a lot of jurisdictional issues that I'd encourage organisers to have a think about, um, and particularly that storage and access issue, um, so that people's data just doesn't float around in um, loophole jurisdictions forever and allow people to come along and play with it. That's a great point and thanks for sharing your story, Julie. And I think one of the things Adam's really interested in getting are people that have had this sort of frustration of um, falling between the tracks of, cracks of different systems. One of the exciting things about running the inquiry through New South Wales is, that, um, as we said, we've probably got best in breed laws on workplace surveillance at the moment, even though they haven't really been looked at for a decade. So we've got something to build off. And then that can become something that becomes a model elsewhere, which has been something that's worked in other bits of workplace legislation as well, hasn't it, Adam? Look, that, that is right. Um, obviously, a national framework would be desirable and would be the most effective because it would cover, hopefully, every employer and every worker. Um, but until there is that willingness, I mean, there doesn't seem to have been much appetite. The, the laws that I'm aware of uh, are state-based laws. There hasn't been any interest by any federal government to really tackle this. When you look at the Commonwealth privacy legislation, it really seems to tackle companies as service providers and tries to regulate the issue of information and data gathering as between companies and their customers not uh, between companies and their employees. doesn't mean it couldn't be changed to do that, but it doesn't do that at the present time. So I think uh, unless or until this issue does become one that public politicians are interested in taking up at the national level, I think, as Peter said, we've got to just try and uh, draw out the examples as best we can through the inquiry, get the case studies, if you will, that really embody and highlight the different issues and problems that need to be addressed and hopefully some of the participants in the inquiry will also have some ideas about how uh, those problems could be could be uh, dealt with um, so look I you know and I've got some ideas of my own about how the laws need to be updated so I think this is very valuable for me to is to hear from people both this, in this morning sessions and also today uh, this afternoon to, to hear about like that Queensland example is quite good because you you have a situation where um, you know uh, is that company for example that in that Queensland example was that service provider to the employer actually breaching the privacy legislation 
uh, in the way that they were dealing with that information they gained essentially from their customer, the company, the employer, but it wasn't the customer's information. I mean, the real problem we've got here is because there's no regulation of how to gather or deal with information, whoever has it can use it. Yeah. Uh, and that seems to be the problem. Another question from the floor from Claire Pullen, if you're there, Claire. You were there. Yeah, yes. Peter, I, I see. I, Here she is. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, look, Adam, I've got a question for you about the role of government. Uh, I was lucky enough to work at the Federal Public Service Union uh, during a, a period entirely almost uh, where all our work was around robo-debt. Uh, and essentially that robo-debt came about in a lot of ways because there were 5,000 workers sacked out of Centrelink and the speculative invoicing software was meant to be a replacement for those workers. And there was also the other wicked problem of... Uh, Liberal governments always cutting budgets for public service agencies. Uh, is there a role for government, do you think, to kind of lead around that stuff, not just regulating the data and how it can be used and what you do with it, but for a government actually going, no, we're going to be a, a centre of excellence around ICT, and particularly given that New South Wales government is such a large employer? Yeah, Claire, you raise a really important question about the role of states, not just as regulators, but also by, by embodying uh, the standards you want to see taken up, including by the private sector. And that's why uh, there's a specific term of reference that we developed for the inquiry, which was how government, as a best practice employer, should manage and use the information generated by its workforce. So that goes not only to notions of uh, how they initiate discussions about uh, putting in place monitoring that enables the, the recording and harvesting of that information, but then how the employer in the form of the state government is able to use that information and also how it's able to interact with its workforce around that use and making sure that any benefits are shared. So we thought this was such an important issue because the state government of New South Wales is not just the biggest employer in New South Wales, it's the biggest employer, I think, in the Southern Hemisphere. So it just shows you, you know, it's got a lot of, if you like, market power and the standards it actually embodies through its actions, I think, can be very powerful and hopefully persuasive, including not only with other governments, but also the private sector. So I think there's a very real role for the state to play as an exemplar of the change and reforms we would like to see put in place. Um, when you look at the fact that there's still no mandatory reporting of significant data breaches, uh, even for customers in, in, in the state government, we still have a long way to go. But that's certainly one of the destinations we'd like to reach through this inquiry. Toby, your view on the role of government in the adaptation of technology more broadly? I think there was a point, I can't find it made in the chat earlier, about governments deliberately circumventing some of these regulations. And I think, as we've seen with RoboJet, there is, and other cases, there have been, there's been a, even before the class action on RoboJet, there was a, the government rapidly paid out without going to litigation. And even in the interim, there has been a case, a case called Pintrick, which was a tax case where a decision was automated and someone was told that they, if they paid their tax return, they would waive the fines. They paid their tax return, which was late. And then the tax office came back and said, oh no, we're really sorry. That was an automated decision. We actually are still gonna fine you. And the judges actually found that that, that decision was not binding, but that case is rarely cited or referred to. Uh, it's almost as though the government were ignoring existing precedent in this area. Um, it's, I think there's an enormous amount of pressure, as, as was also raised, to make the government more efficient and as staff are being cut back. Automation is being turned to more and more as the answer. So although I would love to see the government be a role model in this area, at least the federal level is definitely a huge push to automate many of the roles that are currently fulfilled by people, which doesn't really lead me to think that that sort of leadership is there or that will to lead is there. The other bit of government um, input that Mark might like to expand on is the um, the funding for the the Centre for Excellence that you're working on, and maybe just share with um, the the room a little bit about that work, Mark, because it's really exciting. Parallel to Adam's work. Oh, thank you. 
Yeah, so, so I'm part of a center of excellence that's headquartered out of RMIT. It's devoted to developing uh, approaches to regulating and developing automated decision-making systems that are uh, fair, inclusive, uh, and responsible. And so the, you know, the goal there is to bring together folks who are working across disciplines. So folks who are working in um, sociology and humanities oriented disciplines with people who are working on the tech side and technology partners and a range of um, uh, um, you know, uh, NGOs and other partners who are all interested in imagining how do we develop automated decision-making systems that meet some of the you know, pro-social goals of automation without the pathologies uh, that some, some of which we're talking about. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the assumption there is this tech is coming. Can we shape it in advance in order to avoid some of the pitfalls that we've encountered in the past when we just implement it, but without thinking about this social implications. And, you know, the robot that was, that was one of the big inspirations for thinking about um, what happens if you don't uh, think about the impact of, of the technology before implementing it, or depending on how you parse that situation, um, if the technology is del deliberately implemented in ways that disadvantage um, particular groups who are, may not have the resources to um, uh, seek redress and, and so on. Um, so this is a seven year uh, multi-university project. It's a big, um, you know, it's a kind of big center for academic research in this area. But the goal really is to, is to move beyond the academic world to make connections with um, uh, you know, government partners, private sector partners, and public sector partners. Um, so if that's an area that interests you um, and uh, you're interested in, in learning more about it, please uh, get in touch with me. Um, it's my, my name at Monash, you'll, you'll, I'll post my email. Um, but, but the goal is to kind of create in Australia uh, an area where we can kind of um, work with other people who are interested in these questions to anticipate what are some of the problems. Uh, and, and I think this discussion has been really interesting in terms of thinking about, you know, what are the complexity and the issues that are raised by importing tech, which seems to offer a kind of simple solution, but runs afoul of a lot of concerns that have to do with human rights, and privacy and um, power relations in the workplace. So it's quite easy to just kind of plug something into a computer and let it go. Uh, but as we've seen, it can have huge consequences. And, and uh, so that's what we're working on. It hasn't, the center hasn't started yet. It, it starts up in either late July or August, um, and then it runs for those seven years. I guess, I guess just, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say just on that, I mean, Peter, the, one of the points you and I've discussed in the past around technology is, you know, a new medicine isn't able to be put on the market unless it's allegedly gone through quite thorough testing. And yet new technology, is able to be put on the market for consumers pretty much without jumping through too many hoops. And, you know, Australia, I think, is quite remarkable in being an earlier adopter of new technology. You know, whether it's iPhones, iPads, what have you, we seem to per capita adopt it faster than other uh, OECD nations. And so, you know, it'd be interesting to know whether or not workplace automation, surveillance uh, and monitoring uh, mechanisms are more advanced here than elsewhere, and and uh, or if not, what we can learn from other jurisdictions where it's you know more developed, if it is. Yeah, it's just, it's really interesting, isn't it? You know, we've got two sort of parallel sort of narratives. One is tech solutionism that the that the progress is a self evident forward journey to an improved life, and then this notion that disruption is great. And so you you put those two together, and you start hurtling into the future without really thinking about what you're breaking on the way through. And, you know, in a way, what's really exciting about that your inquiry, Adam, is that the idea of putting some guardrails and some red lines around how technology operates in the workplace opens up an even broader conversation about what the modern workplace should look like. Um, on that, yeah, so before I go back to you and the panel on that thought, I might bring in... Lauren um, from the United Workers Union, who I know is on the call and was part of this morning's discussion because I thought one of the points that you raised that was, I think everyone took away, Lauren, was that it's not just about the technology and sometimes the surveillance 
doesn't even need technology to to sort of have an impact. Yeah, and I think um, you know if we come from an initial understanding of workplaces themselves being a technology of surveillance and that the labour process inherently requires a form of surveillance in order for it to work and then kind of move from there. And I think um, like having a, having a way of developing a framework of understanding the technology that's historically embedded and also very sensitive um, to different labour processes and the way that technologies are compatible, more compatible with certain labour processes than with others. Like say, for example, the gig work, when you have platform mediated forms of employment, to my mind is very similar to just run of the mill piece rates. That's as old as capitalism itself. And that kind of form of labor process is very amenable to um, a particularly invasive form of surveillance technology because they're both so hyper exploitative and there's no democracy at play. And you don't have a great deal of worker power at play. So these things come together in a way that's very harmonious. Whereas trying to implement, implement for, for instance, a peace rates arrangement, say in my work, working in a union would be much more difficult because I have quite a lot of power in my workplace um, and there would be different mechanisms and ways in which I could resist that. Um, and there was a point made before, I didn't catch your name, but I think it was um, a comrade from the CPSU talking about the robo-debt scandal and, and the brutality of, of what happened. One of the initial precursors to that was sacking 5,000 experienced workers are trying to outsource that work. And so I think it's also really important to think about, um, you know, in, in the context of that, the outsourcing of essential public services to labour hire agencies like ADECO, um, who also are the labour hire agency, like for Centrelink, and they were at the, at the centre of the robo-debt scandal, and they also um, are the Amazon labour hire um, provider of choice as well. So there's a common thread there. and. Um, you know, I think it provides just some good case studies where you can compare what's happening at Amazon and what happened with RoboDebt. Some of the common threads is the outsourcing of skilled workers to these labour hire agencies that have a very, um, a very exploitative labour process at the core of them. And sometimes we see these same uh, private companies coming up again and again as well. Yeah, thanks for that. The um, in the chat, there's also been a number of comments about workers that have lost their jobs for, for refusing to give consent. Um, for their biometrics or their fingerprints to be captured. So this has got layer upon layer. We were also speaking earlier today about, you know, the, the long-term dream of um, worker trust where some of this personal information may end up actually being owned by, you know, a super fund of data, for, for example. So I think the contribution that Adam and his quarry can make is, is, is a... Is a a point for us all to think about this, uh, these issues, and maybe set down some markers. Adam, before we finish off, like, how does an inquiry work? And if people are just on this call and they they're interested, do you have to be important to put it in a submission into an inquiry like yours, or how how are you? How's it operating? No, no. Look, uh, um, there is a when when we put out our press release announcing the inquiry. We also open submissions, which will be open until 31 August. And they are submissions uh, open to the whole world. You don't have to be a stakeholder or important to put in a submission to a parliamentary inquiry. You, it's just any interested person or group, uh, not even necessarily restricted to New South Wales, can put in a submission. Um, obviously, once uh, an inquiry gets uh, all of the submissions, when we're putting together... Uh, our schedule of hearings often will want to uh, choose a group of submissions for those people to come and address the inquiry to really draw out some issues. So obviously, uh, obviously the submissions that hit best upon the issues we want to deal with or are perhaps most comprehensive or, or just really illustrate the various problems we're trying to identify. So again, I've been on any number of inquiries where uh, much of the witness lists have just been individuals who have put in uh, an individual submission either about themselves or about someone they know, just really outlining one of the problems that the inquiry is directed to solve. So, you know, any person who is interested who's on the, on the call today, I'd, I'd encourage them to put in a submission on, on any one of the terms of reference we've got. And if there was one thing you'd like to get out of this process, what would it be, Adam? 
Uh, apart from understanding more uh, of the dimensions of the issues that we've been discussing, really, what are what are the solutions that we can put into law? Like, there are some problems that are really, really big and very hard for governments, particularly state governments, to deal with. But I do think you have to make uh, an effort. Uh, we've already done that with the workplace surveillance law we've got, which now is, you know, 20 years behind the times. Uh, what is the best way of uh, regulating this area that gives workers a voice and a place at the table? And ultimately, when you can't reach agreement, who gets to make the decision about what should be allowed? Mm -hmm. I think those are the sort of big questions that we need to try and reach a landing on during this inquiry. Yeah, or well, Zuboff says, who knows, who decides, who decides, who decides. Mark, um, if, you, if there was anything that comes out of a process like this, what would you like to see? Well, well I suppose one of the things would be interesting to see is um, the whole imperative of datafication uh, via monitoring held up to scrutiny. Because, you know, I think there, there are interesting points of um, where we might find a commonality of interest by pointing out that actually the incentives themselves that are associated with this datafication are perverse. We can probably all think of cases where in the workplace we've been subject to forms of datafication whose outcomes actually don't underwrite the, the name in which they're, um, be, they're taking place. You know, this is meant to make you more productive or more efficient, but actually it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, and that's a place where, uh, you know, what's at stake is something different from thinking about um, how to make the workplace work better for both employees uh, and, and employers. And being able to think about, you know, what are the areas where there's some way to find it, 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 it develop the possibilities for the technology to work for both that seems to be the, the important spot to be looking at. And by contrast, examining those points where it's not working and um, forms of datafication, surveillance and monitoring, just um, there isn't any interest in it from the stated perspective of, I don't know, efficiency or productivity, but there's something else going on and those need to be interrogated. Uh, so so I, I guess it's kind of looking for the way to make things work in the interests of both uh, employer and employee. And Kobe, to round that off, what would you love to see out of a process like this? A lot of the writing that I do starts with the starting from no, stop, reflect. What is it the problem? What is the actual problem we're trying to address? What is it that employers actually want to improve? Is tech the best way to do that? If so, what tech? If we have that tech, what limits need to be on that tech? I think we need to slow down and think about these systems before they're used rather than putting them out in the wild and then trying to clean up afterwards. Because once the data's out there and once these systems are embedded, reversing those systems is very, very difficult. So I'd love to see that, that process be required. And then the responses from a regulatory side need to be regulatory, they need to be technical, they need to be policy-based, and they also need to be social. So people need to understand what the systems are. There's an educational component to this piece. It's a, it's a big and ambitious project. So thank you for inviting me to be speaking to speak a little bit on it. Oh, look, thank you all for being part of it today, both our featured speakers in the room. Um, this is tough stuff. It's, it's, it's technically detailed. It's got a political overlay. It's got a power overlay. But I, I feel that it's, it's like a really good red wine. If you get your head around it, it's really rewarding to just sort of spend a bit of time with it, um, which, again, starts with an alcohol metaphor as we um, began. Um, you know, hopefully in a few months we'll have a politics in the pub and we can all go and sort of talk about this for a couple more hours and maybe sing a few songs. But for now, um, thanks for being part of this discussion today. Um, Australia at Home is an initiative of Essential Media, Principal Co, the Centre for Australian Progress and Guardian Australia. Um, we aim to put an idea out there every day. For those loyal Australia at homers, we've actually got nothing tomorrow. It fell through. So we've got a day off tomorrow and you're just going to have to watch daytime telly or something. But we'll be back on Friday with the Guardian Book Club, Christos Sorkos, talking about the great Australian novel that you need to read in conversation with Michael Williams and a couple of other authors whose names escape me at the moment. Um, so um, you'll... 
we'll, we'll be sending out an email after this. We'll put it in, in the link of the, um, the feedback email, a link to Adam's inquiry. And I'll also put in a copy of Mark's little deck um, so that you've all got that. And we look forward to keeping this conversation going over the weeks and months to come. But on that note, thanks everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Cheers, Adam. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Kobe and Lauren and everyone else that spoke.